Why isn't everyone healed when we pray for them? Should we still pray for everyone to be healed if not everyone gets healed? Or pray for God's will? <laughs> okay. I love answering that question. Let me ask you this. When Jesus, I said this last night, when Jesus was on the cross, right? This is Jesus. Like, he's the truth. He's the way. He's the light. He's the life. He's everything, right? Like, he is everything. Creator, everything, right? Okay. When he died on the cross and he died for everyone, how many people came to the cross? Like, how many people gave their lives to Christ when he was on the cross, when he actually died on the cross? Yeah, but how many people actually came during that time? Because that was the reason he had died, right? Like that was the purpose. Okay, so let me ask you this. <clears throat> Did he fail? Did he fail? But that's what he died for, though. To make sure that the world, world wouldn't, wouldn't perish. So, did he fail? So why is it that when we pray for the sick, it's any different? Do we fail when they don't receive healing right then and there? Do we fail? Does Jesus fail? So I guess the question is, does it matter? You know? Like, ask, ask the question again. Oh. Why isn't everyone healed when we pray for them? Should we still pray for everyone to be healed if not everyone gets healed or pray for God's will? Uh, we're to know what the will of God is, first of all, if we're ambassadors of Christ. Um, uh, is it God's will to heal? Uh, Jesus got whipped. Did he get whipped for nothing? Obviously, he got whipped for a reason. So we kind of just got to break that down really simple. And according to um, Jesus, everybody's already healed. Um, what we're doing is we're, already, we're appropriating what Jesus did. So when Jesus sees the world, because um, you got to break this down in two sections. When Jesus sees the world, he sees them as already paid for, but it's really up to them to receive the payment. Can we agree with that? Yeah. So he sees everybody already purchased, correct? Because it says that he died for the sin. He died for the whole world, correct? Yeah. Saved and unsaved. Yeah. So when he sees the world, he sees them purchased, correct? Yeah. Okay, so then he has to see everybody healed as well because he already got whipped. So the thing is not a matter of God healing them. It's a matter of appropriating the same way that you would appropriate the payment for sin. Does that make sense? So we're not asking God to release a healing from heaven because it's already released. It's our job to appropriate it to make sure that they receive that payment that's already been paid for them. Does that make sense? So instead of asking God to heal them, what we're doing is we're fighting for what they already have, what Jesus already paid for. So when we pray for someone to be healed, what we're doing is we're commanding what's already been paid for. It's not that, okay, God, you want to heal them. It's like, I already see you healed, just like I already see you paid for. It's just based on whether you're going to receive it or not, whether you're going to receive the payment. Does that make sense? Um, it's another way of seeing things. Yes, sir? So then it would be better to be constantly thankful than versus asking for the It says to thank the Lord, like mm -hmm. be grateful and thankful and constantly like to ask God to do something that he asks us to do is crazy to me. You know what I mean? Um, like for someone to be healed, like you're praying for someone and they don't manifest in front of them. Like you don't see it immediately. That doesn't mean it didn't work. Just like, okay, when you preach the gospel, like, let's say there's 100 people in here, and they're all unsaved. When you preach the gospel, and nobody gives their life to Christ, do you stop preaching the gospel? Well, why is it any different when you pray for the sick? That's something we need to think about. Because we never give up preaching the gospel. Nobody comes, and we're like, oh, nobody got saved today. Well, I don't think his salvation is going to work. That's good. That's really good. 
I don't think he's gonna save anymore. Oh, the gospel doesn't work. Guys, you gotta make it simple. Like, you gotta make it so simple. Like, we gotta apply the same thing to everything. We can't shift things around. So when we say someone didn't manifest healing, we can't say it's not God's will. That's be like saying, well, they didn't give their life to Christ, so it must not be God's will for them to be saved. I guess God wants them to go to hell. So, is that simple enough for you? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, but there's still people who die after praying, like from uh, an illness. Um, yeah. It, it, when they're not healed, it, to receive healing, is it based on a decision that they have to make to receive it? Or? There's, this, there's this lion that walks around seeking whom he may devour, and he came to steal, kill, and destroy. Um, all the apostles were martyred, except one of them, John. If they were so full of power, which they were, why did they die so hard? Why did they die that way? Does that make sense? We're going to be attacked. We're, in, we're at war. And we always want 100% all the time. Always want 100%. But we're not willing to give 100%. Does that make sense? People will still die. People will still die. Because we're in a fallen world. And what I try to tell you is when we pray for people and we don't see instant healing, we never say it didn't work. Because if the, the prayer of faith, if you're the one praying for that and you say it didn't work, you just took that whole seed, you just ripped that whole thing out of him. I tell people that, like when you pray for someone and they walk off and you go, oh, it didn't work. You just ripped out everything you sowed into that man or into that woman. Everything that you sowed into them, you just ripped out by saying it didn't work. Because within the hour, some got healed. And as they left, they got healed. And it's like a seed. It takes time. Some things take longer than others. You know, but we still pray for them. And we know that his word never comes back void. But what ends up happening is we end up believing the lie more than the truth. And if, like, if the seed is truth, it has to be fed truth. But if we're denying or not believing, it just shrivels up and dies because it's a seed. We're, we're constantly sowing seed. Like that's what we're doing. We plant seeds all day long. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. um, we prayed absolutely believing she was going to be healed. Uh -huh. A week later, she died. Um, uh -huh. Is it something that we did wrong, or what do we tell the family? Well, yeah, okay, hold on a minute. Um, if you decide to start going into, like, you know, the quote healing ministry, these are the kind of questions you'll get all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's. <laughs> It's never easy dealing with losses. Um, we've seen, I mean, I'm sure Pete, you can testify, Jason, you, you guys all who have been doing this for a while can testify, Pastor, I'm sure you too. Like, it's not easy at all. Um, but one thing more than anything is uh, something that I, I'm gonna read this real fast out of Matthew. Matthew 10, one says, Jesus gave his, called his 12 disciples and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease and sickness. Okay. Every disease and sickness. And then he says in uh, Luke 10, 8 through 9, when you enter a town are welcomed, eat what's before you and heal the sick who are there. Tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. There's, and there's a whole bunch more that I'm going to talk about a little bit um, on Monday, but there's at least 12 or... 10 or 12 verses where it says, and everywhere Jesus went, he healed them all. Over and over and over. Matthew 9, 35 is one of them. Acts 10, 38 is another one. Uh, if Jesus perfectly modeled the will of God, which is Hebrews 1, 3 and Colossians 1, 15, we have to conclude that that is God's will. Okay? However, when the disciples, I mean, you guys remember the disciples couldn't cast the demon out of the one boy, right? So they come to Jesus and they ask them the same question. Why couldn't we do it? You know, why, why didn't it happen? And so Jesus says to them, uh, this is Matthew 17, the disciples said, why couldn't we 
to drive out the demon. He said, because of your unbelief, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, here's the difference, and I want to make this very clear. He did not put the responsibility on the sick person. How much faith did Lazarus have to get healed? <laughs> okay. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't help, you know, when you're ministering to, to people. Um, the, the foundational thing about all of this for us is, one, don't get your identity out of what you do. Get your identity out of Christ. Because if you get your identity out of what you do, when you fail, when you, when you stumble, you're, always, you're going to immediately question the will of God. You're going to immediately question, well, is this real? Is this going to happen? I mean, when you started walking, you know, when you fell, you weren't like, oh, maybe I just shouldn't walk. You know, you, you, you get up. Uh, it says, what is that in Proverbs? It says, uh, a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up again. It's, it, we're all learning. We're all in the process. Dude, I'm, I'm wearing glasses. Okay. <laughs> People, people send me emails, seeing my videos. They're like, does everyone you pray for gets healed? I'm like, yep, every single one, all the time. <laughs> you know, they're like, why don't you pray for yourself? I do. I've been praying for my eyes. I'm just being trans. Can we, can we be real here? Like, I've been praying for my eyes for about four years. Okay. Just a few months ago, uh, a bug flew in front of my face and I, I killed it. It was a mosquito. And I put it in front of me to look at it. And I had to lift my glasses up to see it. Because my vision's getting better. Now, why is it taking four years? I don't know. Um, but what I do know is I cannot afford to let my level of experience dictate what the scripture says. I have to bring it the other way around. And so when we see people, when we see people fall, when we see people that don't get well, um, two things. One, Jesus put it on the disciples' unbelief. Now, again, if you get your identity out of what you do, that's a hard thing to swallow, right? Because then you're like, he didn't say it to put condemnation on him. He asked, they asked the question and he answered the question. Um, have, have, how many, let's just be honest, how many of you guys have seen a full on demonic manifestation? Like, like I'm talking snake rights, you know, like people snaking around and growling at you and stuff, and, you know. For those of you who have seen it, like, what was, what was like the first thought that went through your head? Oh my God. <laughs> you know, because there's nothing that can really prepare you for it. Um, you know, and I think that that's what happened in that situation with the disciples. There was kind of like a, whoa, that's crazy. I don't know what to do here. Um, but really what it boils to is they picked themselves up and they went at it again because they, they were walking with the, the living manifestation of God himself. And they still see him healing all the sick. And so Jesus also said in Matthew, this, now this is an interesting one. He said in Matthew 15 to the Pharisees, he said, you have made the word of God of no effect because of your traditions. Now, John chapter one says that Jesus is the word of God. That phrase is always reserved for talking about Christ in the scriptures. And so Jesus was literally telling the Pharisees, you have made me ineffective in your life because of your man-made traditions that you've passed down. And it's frustrating because, I mean, how, dude, how many unbelievers have you prayed for? And it's like, boom, easy. They've never been churched. They've never, they've never heard all these man-made religious traditions that have been passed down. And, I, and I'll tell you just real briefly what a lot of the ones you'll hear about healing. You'll hear about Paul's thorn. You'll hear about Job. You'll hear about Timothy's stomach. You'll hear about uh, God's timing. You'll hear about God's sovereignty. All these things. How many of them did Jesus mention? And if Jesus is the will of God, we've got to deal with that. Now, I'll, you know, I'll talk more about um, all that stuff because that's, that's a long conversation. <laughs> Um, and I know I just poked a bunch of stuff, and if you want to talk to me later, that's cool. But understand, Jesus is the will of God. He modeled it perfectly. And we have to get our identity in him and bring our level of experience up to that. And whenever we have a loss, get around people who will bring you up and encourage you in that instead of people who are going to bring you down and say, you know what, it just wasn't God's will. Amen. And I'm sorry that you, know, you had that loss, but we know what it's like. 
I, there's, we have compassion for you. So. I, want, I want to add to that. Um, you know how he was saying, you were saying questioning. There's something, I'm going to throw a gold nugget at you guys. A lot of people don't know this. Um, <laughs> Peter, James, and John went up the mountain before that, before the demon, before the, the boy was in the demon. Peter, James, and John were on the way up the mountain of transfiguration, correct? Okay. It says that Peter, James, and John, and Luke, they're falling asleep. It's funny how they're the same three that are in the garden, falling asleep. It's, I always ask myself, why are they falling asleep? <laughs> Uh, if you're with Jesus, you're going to be tired. <laughs> you are not going to sleep. Uh, if you hang out with me and Ryan and Quayla, you are not going to sleep. You won't be tired. Cordell, where you at? Okay. And whenever, he snores. That's yeah, why I didn't whenever we sleep. Do sleep. <laughs> hey, I even battle in my sleep. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so anyways, they're at the Mount of Transfiguration. And they see something... Amazing. They see Jesus transfigurate, right? He transfigures. And they walk into the glory cloud. And, okay. and then it says when the day was spent. So you know they were there all night, but you never hear what they did. You know? Like nobody knows what they did. I believe Jesus was teaching them how to pray, how to spend time with the Father, because it was towards the evening, and that's what Jesus would do. He would pour out all day, and in the evening he spent time with the Father. But this is something that we don't think about. Um... When they couldn't cast the demon out of the boy, it says that Jesus was coming up down the mountain. He says, what are you guys talking about? Basically, he said, what are you guys arguing about? Because there was an argument going on. Right? And the Sadducees were there in the crowd. And they had the, the demon-possessed boy. His dad was there. I believe that they were kind of, because Jesus wasn't there, I believe that the Sadducees, well, now that Jesus ain't here, maybe we'll bring him in here and we'll get it going. And since we don't believe in the resurrection and we don't believe in, in, in the spiritual realm, and I don't think they can do it. So I think what happened was they got, they got confronted with something and Jesus wasn't there. Now, a lot of people tell you that the 12 apostles couldn't cast the demon out, right? How many people can agree with that? Right? Okay, that's not true. There was only nine there. The other three were with Jesus. See, we don't even think about that. I like that's that one, Ryan. That's good. Yeah, okay. I'm using that. I'll tell you later. There was only nine there. The three were with Jesus. The three could have cast the demon out. Because those are the same three that raised the little girl from the dead. So, are you going to argue about it? Like the nine? Or are you going to hang with Jesus? Because Jesus don't argue. And these are the same three that don't argue. They don't argue in Scripture. They don't argue anything. They just do it. And so, back to your question, the little girl, you know, she had died, and it, it's, it's not good. It's not good. But what happens is, this is what I believe, based on that scripture, the three didn't have to ask that. The three didn't have to ask, why couldn't we cast the demon out? Because they already knew they could, because they're the ones that never sleep, because they're always with Jesus. And so... Based on that, I'd say, hang with Jesus. Get to know him. And you won't have to ask that question, just like Adam and Eve didn't have to ask for anything either. And so, based on that, their unbelief, well, Jesus wasn't there. That's why they couldn't cast the demon out. Because when Jesus isn't there, we have to rely on what Jesus has taught us. And he's always with us. But these nine... They felt intimidated because their solid, their solid walk wasn't in Christ because it says their hearts were hardened because Jesus had fed the multitudes and, and Peter walked on water. It says that their hearts were hardened. Something wasn't right. So based on that, either you're going to be the nine or you're going to be the three and, you know, you're going to lose people. I've lost a lot of people that I've prayed for, but it doesn't change. We don't walk by what we see. We walk by what we believe.